Salih, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I want to talk about const generics, such as what came out recently in Rust 151. Const generics are where your generic type parameters to a struct or to a function, for example, can contain not only types, but also constant values, such as integer, bool, or care. And one handy place to use this is with small vector operations. This might remind us of a video I made over a year ago about zero-cost abstractions in C++, Rust, and Zig. A somewhat controversial topic, but still fun, and we saw that these loops could get optimized down to non-loop vector operations in the machine code. The same thing works for the examples today, where again we're doing norms of small vectors, as well as dot product operations. We see the loops go away, and we get efficient machine code. This works for Rust, C++, and Zig today, but I couldn't get the same efficient output for the other languages we'll be looking at. Maybe someone else watching this can figure it out. And for our example of dot product between two vectors, the dot product can be calculated by multiplying the matching components of two vectors and then summing up the products. This also effectively measures the alignment between two vectors as well as their length. And when you take a dot product of a vector with itself, it's always aligned, so it's just a measure of the length of the vector. This also reminds us of the Pythagorean theorem we multiply the matching components of the vector with itself, or some of the squares, and we take the square root for the length or norm of the vector. And to keep things simple, I'll use a 3, 4, 5 triangle as the example today, except divided by 2 for a little more interesting, so 1.5, 2, 2.5. Let's look at some code. And we'll start in Rust, because that was the motivator for today. Here we have our dot and our norm functions, generic both in the value type for our scalars, though constrained to be some kind of floating point type here in its trait, as well as a constant for the size of the vector. Here's the example value, a 1.52 vector, whose length, or effectively diagonal, would be 2.5. The norm is defined by a dot product of the vector with itself, and take the square root, as we saw with the Pythagorean theorem earlier. And to calculate the dot product, we'll just zip the two vectors together, which are represented just by sized arrays, which already existed in Rust before. Then we multiply each matching element and sum them up starting from zero. Let's run this and see what we get. There's the 2.5 we expected. And I was explicit here with the affectionately named TurboFish operator, where I explicitly said that I wanted F32s and two of them. But this can also be inferred. If I take that away and run it, it still works. The type and runtime constant are implicitly passed in. And worth pointing out that the compiler knows the size of these arrays, they're not known at runtime, and customized versions of these functions get generated for the explicit size of 2 and value type of f32. Let's take a quick look at size of here to consider this. Here we see the size of an array of two f32s, and the size of a pointer to a slice of f32 whose length is known at runtime. Let's see the sizes here. We see the first is size 8, two f32s should be 8 bytes. But this pointer here is 16 bytes, 8 bytes for the memory address, and 8 bytes for the length of the slice. And in these examples, we're using this kind of type and not this kind of type, so that we know that we're generating customized machine code that's efficient for these sizes. Now, you wouldn't want to use this for arbitrarily large vectors, but for small vectors, which you might want a large number of, this can be very efficient. And note that here I'm using the new int to iter feature to iterate over the array as a value. Using older style from before Rust 1.51, I'd end up iterating over them as references and have to dereference the values in my multiplication. Although both of these end up compiling to the same efficient machine code for the example today. Also fun to notice, since I'm the kind of person who prefers multiple characters in my type parameters, if I wanted to name this constant lowercase i-z-e, the compiler complains at me for not following the style, that it should be all uppercase. I guess this makes it easier to know for people like me whether this is a constant or a type that I'm using. There also are limitations in the currently shipped const generics of Rust. So for example, I can't put the type after the constant inside of my angle brackets. It says precisely that if I look at the error message. They're hoping to remove this limitation in the future, but that's how it is today. Another thing I noticed is that the WHERE clause doesn't work for consts. This is something you can do in Rust in case your trait constraints end up extra long. I can remove it from here 
and put it after the return type. The same thing doesn't work for my constants. Const down here is no good. And leaving off the colon up here is no good either. Still, having const generics in Rust will make certain new kinds of usage patterns much more efficient. And just to prove that this is generic in the size, I could make this a length three vector, where vectors here really are just sized arrays. Now I have three dimensions. And if I run this, I get something larger than the 2.5 length I had before. No code changes were needed up here to support that third element in the arrays. Now, Rust isn't the first language by any means to contain this kind of feature. For example, C++ has had it for years. And here, instead of using std array directly, I made a type alias to be shorter. Norm is like before, and dot product uses transform reduce from the standard library, which by default uses multiply and add in the right place to make a dot product for us. And I start from a zero of our value type. I create an array with the official type parameters and I print out the norm. Let's run it. And we get 2.5 as expected. Now note a difference here between C++ and Rust. To say I want to type, I put the word type name or alternatively class in front of my name. And for a constant, I just put the type here. In Rust, types were the default and I say const to get a constant value. And worth pointing out that in C++, the order of type constant doesn't exist. I can swap these around, and my norm function acts the same as before. They're still being inferred, just like they were last time. Still get a 2.5. Go back again. Still working. And worth pointing out, like I mentioned before, that customized versions of these functions are created for the various type arguments. So if we ask here, what's inside of my executable, I see there's a specific norm function for float and two of them. Let's take a quick look at nim, where here I'm using generics in a fashion very similar to C++ or Rust. Only I say static for a constant and types are back to being the default as in Rust. And it works the same, the 2.5 output. And I tried a number of different ways of doing this loop here, and none of them gave me the same efficient machine code that Rust, C++, and Zig give me. Maybe someone watching this video can figure it out for me. And before we move on to Zig, I want to take a look at something here. In all three of these languages, though the syntax changes some between them, we can sort of think of these functions as functions that return other functions. So we have a compile time function here with these parameters that returns a function which can be used at runtime right here. Now it's not really what's happening. And the specialized syntax and semantics allow us to infer those type arguments but it still sets us up to think about what we're actually going to do more explicitly in Zig. Because here we explicitly do make a function that returns other functions from it. Here's our dot and our norm, where the norm calls the dot function right there. And we pass in parameters of size and a compile time value, which is a type, and we return a type. Well, this type is simply a struct that wraps some static functions. And to get our customized vector operations, we call the function and we can store them here in a constant value. This happens at compile time so that later it can be used for runtime operations. It's a function that returns functions. Let's run this. We get 2.5 as expected. And of course, any order of these parameters will work fine since it's just a function. And all we had to be explicit outside the generic context, when we go into the generic context here, or within this function scope, these functions can call each other rather easily without worrying about monomorphized versions of them. And while Zig is a new language under development with these compile time code features, this might remind us of a more established language that does something very similar. And that's OCaml here. Some of the things we see here today might apply as well in standard ML. In OCaml, as in many languages, modules are a unit of encapsulation, but they're also in OCaml a unit of abstraction. And we can declare module types with signatures that tell us what to expect inside of a kind of module. So here we have a value type where we can have add, multiply, square root, and zero for calculating dot products and norms, as well as to string for printing out the values. And then a vector module has a value module inside it and a size for our vector. Then to create an actual module, we can pass in some kind of vector module type. 
This is effectively a compile time function, and we return a struct with functions inside of it, where interestingly, we see the same struct keyword in OCaml as we saw in Zig. And I abusively loop down here on the vector size rather than using the already runtime known length of arrays. This differs from the previous languages we saw where the arrays had compile time known length because in OCaml, our arrays always carry runtime length along with them. So I just abusively loop over the size instead. Then I can create customized operations for floats, although float in OCaml is 64 bits always. So to prove I could be generic, I also made one that goes over complex values. In the float case, I just use the standard float module from the standard library, but I customize the complex one to have a two-string operation and to tweak the multiply for proper dot product calculation for complex numbers. Then to use it, I make an array and I call the norm and to string on it. And it works as expected. I won't demo it here, but the complex case works as well. Now before we're done, let's abuse some Python. In Python, just like OCaml and Zig, I make a function here called vecops that returns some static methods, which can be used for dot product and norm. And again, the norm function calls the dot function above it. Then I create a customized set of vector operations for two float 32s. Now Python, like OCaml, just has 64-bit floats built in. So I'm using NumPy here to have more variety. Then I create an array of two float 32s and I call my customized norm operation. And here this function, I can receive a size and a value type, just like Zig and OCaml. And just like in OCaml, I pretend I don't know the size of my arrays, and I loop on the integer passed in instead. I use the value type at runtime to create a customized zero. And I also use the static typing annotations that exist in Python these days to annotate my vector and value types in my functions. Let's run it, and we get 2.5 as expected. Though, unlike Zig and OCaml, it's not really compile time code operation, but more load time code operation. When you load up a module in Python, it gets cached. So this gets run once when the module is first loaded. But since we're in a dynamic language, we can do more things for good or ill. So for example, I can actually delete that dot function before I use it, which will give me an error. Before we're done, I also want to look at one more thing. I earlier had hoped to use tuples to express my vectors, because tuple types in Python can be statically checked for their lengths. Except I wanted a length defined by the size passed in. So I made a tuple dynamically based on that size. I could even use the passed in value type here instead of the generic type variable. If I run this, I see that my dynamically generated tuple type matches my static definition. And I can also make the float32 specific one as well. However, what didn't work here was getting type checking to work. When I tried using the MyPy type checker to check against vectors that are generated dynamically at runtime versus the pseudo static time that I used up here, it didn't know what to do with them. So I moved away from using these and just use an arbitrary sequence instead. So anyway, we got to see a few languages where we explicitly made functions returning functions, two of them with explicit compile time, as well as a few languages with const generics as explicit type parameters. Now, of course, Rust, C++, and NIM can also do macros in different ways from each other, but that will have to be for a different day. Meanwhile, hope today's been fun. If you like the video, be sure to subscribe. Tschüss.